before Gibson, who put the punk into cyberpunk, Bruce Sterling and John Shirley, that's who. That's why we're in front of a load of rock and roll records today and a few old issues of Impulse and New Worlds because punk is an important part of cyberpunk. It's not just cyber. Cyberpunk. Everything gets punk stuck on the end as a suffix these days, including loads of things which aren't punk at all. Well, let me tell you, this is the real deal. Who put the bump? These guys did it. So we're talking about Sterling and Shirley today. Sterling you've probably heard of. Shirley you may not of. Well, let's reveal it. If you read William Gibson's introduction to the 10th anniversary edition of Neuromancer, which I've got a copy of somewhere, it's my reading copy. Apparently it's very rare, the UK edition was remaindered, and yet apparently it's really rare, so I might move mine on, even though I am quite fond of it. It's signed by Gibson, but all my Gibson stuff is signed for the times I've met him over the years. So when you read that introduction, he cites several things which are influential. He cites Alfred Bester, and that gets talked about a lot, Bester's influence over cyberpunk, and it's absolutely right, because it's both got the corporate side from Ben Reich in The Demolished Man, and the emphasis generally is on Tiger Tiger, The Star's My Destination, with Gully Foyle, and he the common man who rises up after he, you know, he gets left behind in Volga and his search for vengeance. But there's more to it than that. We mentioned Moorcock, all sorts of new wave things. but. Getting back to the sort of punk generation, the other thing that Gibson mentioned, he mentions two other things. He mentions this record, um, which is the Velvet Underground and Nico, their first album. That's a Japanese SACD version. I've got about eight or nine versions. I've been listening to that since about 1980. The thing with most artistic movements is that the pioneers who start them are never called what they are. I mean, the Velvet Underground are arguably the first punk band. Even though punk was used in the late 60s, punk rock was really used in the 70s, late 70s. So he said that was a key influence. And, you know, it's an art rock record. It contains the Welsh avant-garde classical musician John Cale. So somebody from my country, I'm very proud, helped invent avant-garde rock and roll. Lou Reed's on there, Nico. So it's a European-American axis of artists working together. And there's references to all sorts of things in there. And that's for another video. But that was an important thing for Gibson. The best was important. Obviously, things like Dick and Delaney were as well. The other thing he mentions was going to a drugstore stand, late 50s, early 60s, and picking up a paperback anthology of Beat Generation writings. And this is a very Beat Generation thing, Burroughs, Kerak, what have you. And that countercultural strand feeds into the hippies and then at the punks later on. So really, that's the thing. And this book, John Shirley City Come A-Walking, this is a, let's see, it's the Eyeball Press edition. Well, this is about 20 odd years old, and there's a forward by Gibson. And in there, he tells you how Shirley schooled him in how you became a punk writer and how he was there first. Now, John Shirley, exceptionally cool guy, never met him. We've had some interactions over the years. And basically, Shirley was a punk rock singer in the Bay Area of San Francisco. The whole Search and Destroy school, the Search and Destroy was the fanzine, of course, started by V. Vale, the ballad expert, publisher of Research Press, who's still out there in California now, selling his books outside City Lights the odd day. And Shirley was in punk bands and he was sort of like writing on the side and I say this is a reissue of City Come Walking and City Come Walking has a claim to sort of arguably be the first punk rock book and we're going to talk about that and it's a great great book there's been various editions I think it's out of print at the moment it's well worth tracking down and this is another one of John's early books Transmania Con and Transmania Con that's a reference to the song Transmania Con MC at Motorcycle Club Transmania Con MC by the Blue Oyster Cult from one of their early records and even the Blue Oyster Cult like a heavy metal band they were associated with punk rock in the UK because they used to get covered in sniffing glue, the punk fanzine, which Mark B, Mark Perry of Alternative TV used to run. So there's all sorts of punk things in there. So it's not just called cyberpunk because it sounds good. It's for a reason. Here's some more of John's early books. I have some more somewhere, including a rather nice limited edition, 
which I should have dug up, but I'm not quite sure where it is. That's a book called Heat Seeker, and he's still active. It's a new book up now. I'll flash it up on the screen. I haven't bought it yet. Looks like a romp. And this is a particularly rare one, Dracula in Love, which is a horror novel. And he's done a fair amount of horror. Three Rings, Psychus, You Hardly Ever See, and A Splendid Chaos, a book which is virtually impossible to get in good neck, but Splendid Chaos, wonderful. And there is a punk trilogy called A Song Called Youth, which begins with a book called Eclipse. And often punk musicians are characters in his story. So if you like punk rock, it's a great thing to do. So we're gonna talk about a bit about John and basically, how did I have contact with him? Well, way back in the late 90s, it was 1998, I was editing a literary diary for the bookselling firm that I was working for at that point. And basically the way it worked was that in the diary, there were two editions. You had a desk diary, which is like sort of full page to view. So you'd open it up and you get a full page as it were like that across two, um, across two leaves. And fundamentally, each day there had to be a literary anniversary, a birth, a death, a publication date, anything to do with literature. And there was an over, overall theme for the diary. And for 1999, the theme was identity. I chose the theme and I put the thing together entirely on my own. Um, I did work with a designer on the design thing. Other than that, it was all my work. And it was great fun and I really enjoyed doing it. And it was a struggle then because the internet was going, but I didn't have a PC and nobody much was online in 98. And the research would have been far easier now. So you had to go through lots of books and what have you. So it took quite a long time. I had to get permissions for rights to quote things. And of course, being the outlaw bookseller, I didn't just want to do the sort of discreet, calm, accepted version of literature. I wanted to put some other things in because the theme was identity. So I managed to sneak in things by Richard Hell, Jim Morrison and John Shirley. And I chose City Come A Walk In and a quote from that because it is fundamentally about identity. And I'll just talk you through the plot now. Shirley was born in 1954, same year as Bruce Sterling. And City Come A Walk In was published in 1980. It's set in San Francisco in 2008. So obviously that's the past now and things have gone on. And it's set in San Francisco, where Shirley was from, and tr trod the streets and trod the boards as Johnny Paranoid in his punk bands. And it's an urban sprawl, cash is no longer acceptable, tender, the populace are always threatened by mob interference, and there's brutal mass vigilantism going on as well. That's the thing in K.W. Jeter's Dr. Adder as well, which was written years earlier but published afterwards. So you've got this leading face on the club scene called Stuart Cole, and you just get the feeling that Stu Cole is kind of almost like John maybe, and he's a 40-ish owner of a club called Anesthesia, and it's a venue where unfortunately computer composed dance tracks throb mindlessly between the live sets of the bands playing there. And you've got to remember this is long before samplers and things. This is before the dance music thing. So he managed to sort of see that disco and rock would be in opposition still in his future. And anyway, at Anesthesia Stu, he puts on bands, you know, between the dance music, because obviously he really likes. And the genre of music that's sort of livid then in the club scene in that future SF is um, called angst rock and it's basically punk. And there's a clashing aesthetic between the two different musics and it attracts a diverse clientele to anesthesia and the hipness of these people is boosted by Stu's history because he's a former political lobbyist and he's willing to challenge Bay Area corruption. And then one night at his club, he clocks this guy standing at the bar, a striking trench coated figure who's motionless and impassive and he's got mirror shades on. And basically Cole, he's, he's intrigued by this guy and he talks to the singer in the, that night's band, a girl called Katz Whalen, which is the only thing I don't like in the book. Katz Whalen is really, really naff, but it's kind of funny. And Katz fronts this sort of um, angst rock band. And she's mildly telepathic and she sort of scans this big guy for information and she conveys sense impressions that she's getting from this figure in a song that her band then get up on stage and play and the song's called City Come A Walk In, like the novel. It appears that this being, this mirror shaded trench coated being, is nothing less than a materialized avatar of San Francisco itself, the embodiment of the city, a gestalt entity which is born of the merged will and energy of human minds and machines. And this being can only be called one thing, city. 
and City does go a walking. Now Cole follows City out into the streets and it's just <laughs> fantastic. And he, he sees the reality of Katz's claim that this being is the embodiment of the city of human mind and machine together. And it can do almost anything. And alongside City, Cole takes a stand along the, alongside the kind of merciless might of the metropolis itself and with the intention of righting all the wrongs in the city and stop it blighting the streets, which are the veins of it. And it's gritty and it's gleaming and impassioned. And it's just absolutely wonderful. And it's a key work of the cyberpunk school. So it's got the influence of sort of poetic alt-rot icons like Patti Smith, the prescient visions of the coming IT era and the way that music would be increasingly machine made. And it's one of several vivid, heartfelt novels he's written. And that's the thing, John's got real heart. He really cares. He's not just an angry brat. You know, he's, he's a sort of mature human being and he just really cares and he wants everything to be right for people on the street and you know the attitude is just there and it's methadrine laced and there's wonderful moments where you know city can turn around glare at a car and it smashes into a wall and it's all sorts of wonderful stuff so it really is interesting and you get that harsh gleaming chromium edge of burning cityscape that you get in Neuromancer and I say Gibson himself endorses it so do try and get hold of city camera walking because cyberpunk as I've said before, there's only a few real cyberpunk books and they're all early ones. After that, it's cliche piled upon cliche. This is the real thing from a real punk rocker. I can't say enough good about it. It's such a great fun read and bags of tood. So the publishers are really pleased that I was quoting the book and John was pleased. And a few years later on, when I wrote 100 Must Read Science Fiction Novels, um, I was in touch with him and he said, oh, it's a rocking thing that you put my book in. That's great. Thank you. And he sent me a copy of his then new horror novel, Creepers, which was great fun. And he tends to write science fiction horror rather than supernatural. That's kind of an exception, really, that one. And, you know, and he is a really cool guy, you know, and it was, it was fantastic. We had a couple of contacts after that, the genuine thing. And you know, he does get pushed aside and forgotten. So, you know, if you think you're one of the cyberpunk sort of originals, you need to go back before Gibson and look at City Camera Walk In. Here's an identity parade, if you like, of Sterling's early works, looking left to right chronologically, left to right as we read in the alphabet, Involution Ocean, The Artificial Kid, in its US hardcover first and the UK first in a penguin paperback and Schismatrix, the most famous of these books. I would argue, I would say it's the least important. I would say it's the one people know and it's really good, but I would argue for Involution Ocean and I'm gonna tell you why. I'll do a plot description. This is loosely adapted from 100 Must Read Science Fiction Novels. Involution Ocean was published in 1977 in the Harlan Ellison Discovery series. At that point, Bruce would have been 23. So there you go, 1977, the year of punk rock in the UK. Also in the States, it started a bit earlier in the States, didn't break through big in the States. In the UK, it did, of course. So what's it about? Well, I'll tell you. There's a drug addict called John Newhouse, and he lived lives on a colonized world, um, and it's called Nell Aqua. Now, Nell Aqua, course means it's latin no water and null null a a van vogt so there's a recursive reference there so john newhouse lives in the house on null aqua and he makes his living and sustains a drug habit by dealing to friends um, who come from the planet reverie now reverie is a planet that's mentioned in harlan ellison's cosmology i think it's in the kyben stories so this guy john newhouse it's got this wonderful beginning in the book where he says everybody has emptiness in their lives and he just I decided to fill his with drugs so it's punk attitude from the beginning it's william s barrows right from the beginning so john newhouse's poison is a narco psychedelic called syncophene and the users call it flare that's the slang term and it's distilled from an oil which is derived from a species of whale that lives only in the bizarre Nalakwan ocean. And this, the ocean on Nalakwa isn't water, Nalakwa, no water, it's dust, okay? It's a sea of dust. 
No, the Galactic Confederacy are trying to encourage the Nalakwan government to start cracking down on users of Flare. So it's the opposite thing from Dune. It's the opposite way round. Whereas in Dune, you have this thing with the spice melange which can seemingly do everything and it's this universal panacea and it's just you know it just doesn't work that way in the real world of drugs and basically the galactic confederation are going to crack down because flare is really dangerous and makes people addicts and eventually it kills them so well, as the crackdown comes what happens then is new house is supplies are cut off and he and his fellow addicts share a house and there's a wonderful passage at the beginning describing the different people in the house and they're all from different backgrounds and there's a neuter called daylight mulligan who is you know afraid of anybody who has genital organs and just wonderful wonderful stuff and it's, it's a very brief book and that's one of its virtues really you get this wonderful background of these drug addicts and newhouse signs on as a able seaman on a whaling ship on Nal Aqua and the captain is called Nils Desperandum and he goes on this voyage so he can be involved with the hunting of the Duswells and get some raw unadulterated syncophene flare. Um, so you know he goes right to the heart of it so his references to Moby Dick and to Dune and interestingly if you look at the back of the book it doesn't have any blurb and Dune didn't have a blurb then at that point and I'm pretty sure that's a Pennington um, like Dune had at that stage and it's just full of attitude there's a sequence in there where Newhouse falls in with this bizarre alien woman called Deluza and Deluza has wings and she's humanoid but not human and they have this strange erotic interaction and because of their skin chemistry being different if if Newhouse touches her, she breaks out in boils and sores. So there's a kind of S&M thing going on, which is very Velvet Underground, very Venus in Furs. And it's absolutely wonderful. And there's so many ideas stuffed into this book. But it is this punk take on Moby Dick and Dune. And it's far, far more interesting. It moves at a real fast pace. And it gets really wild towards the end. It's very funny. And the world building is amazing. Null Aqua is a sphere, obviously it's a planet and the surface of it is uninhabitable there's virtually no atmosphere and the only atmosphere is in this massive meteorite crater and that's where the ocean is at the bottom of the crater and the towns and the settlements are all around the edges and the people from Nal Aqua basically they've sort of been there a long time so they've developed sort of lots of hair in their ears and noses to filter out the dust so it's just absolutely marvelous stuff so you know do get out there and read it i really recommend it that was the first book i read by him it was heavily remained in the uk it was reissued by nel about 86 and i say it's in my book and i think it's just wonderful and it's great great fun and i've mentioned it other times on the channel so if you've seen me mention before i do apologize but i really want you to read it because it's excellent and there are bruce his following works the artificial kid key cyberpunk things so he's one of the guys who put the punk into cyberpunk so there you have it before gibson you had involution ocean the punk dune the punk moby dick fantastic i'm not going to mention her again because i've mentioned it so many times guys when i see you commenting on here that you've read it if you can find it you know then i'll stop i'm going to stop now so do thank you for indulging me great great stuff and seek this out I'm not sure if it's in print anymore. There are copies out there. Um, people pick it up and don't know what it is. Somebody sent me to Moid a while ago. I don't think he's read it yet, but I would say do get a hold of a copy. John's new book is out. I will have flashed up on the screen probably just after this. And look into his work. He's a fantastic guy. Thanks very much. This is Outlaw Bookseller signing out for now. I'm going to make another video in a minute. I'll probably wear the same stuff as well. You know how it is.